Chapter 22. Peta drops the sheath and buries the knife into the monkey's back, stabbing it again and again until it releases its jaw. He kicks the mud away, bracing for more. I have his arrows now, a loaded bow, and Finnick at my back, breathing hard but not actively engaged. Come on, then! Come on! shouts Peta, panting with rage. But then something happened to the monkeys, backing up into the trees, fading into the jungle, as if unheard, a voice calls them away. A game maker's voice telling them this is enough. Get her, I say to Peta. We'll cover you. Peta gently lifts up the morphling and carries her the last few yards to the beach while Finnick and I keep our weapons at the ready. But except for the orange carcasses on the ground, the monkeys are gone. Peta lays the morphling on the sand. I cut away the material over her chest, revealing a four deep puncture wounds. Blood slowly trickles from them, making them look far less deadly than they are. The real damage is inside. By the position of the openings, I feel certain that the beast like ruptured something vital, like a lung, like maybe even her heart. Oh, okay. She lies on the sand, <gasps> gasping like a fish out of water, sagging skin, sickly green, her ribs as prominent as a child's dead of starvation. Surely she could afford food, but turned to the morphling as Hamish turned to drink, I guess. Everything about her speaks of waste, her body, her life, the vacant look in her eyes. I hold one of her twitching hands, unclear whether it moves from the poison affected by the, our nerves or the shock of the attack, or withdrawal from the drug that was her sustenance. There is nothing we can do, nothing but stay with her while she dies. I'll watch the trees. Fennec says before walking away. I'd like to walk away too, but she grips my hands so tightly. I would have to pry off her fingers, and I don't have the strength for that kind of cruelty. I think of Rue how maybe I could sing a song or something, but I don't even know the Morphling's name, let alone if she likes songs. I just know she's dying. Peter crouches down on her other side and strokes her hair. When he begins to speak in a soft voice, it seems almost nonsensical, but the words aren't for me. With my paint box at home, I can make every color imaginable. Pink, as pale as a baby's skin, or as deep as rhubarb green like spring grass, blue that shimmers like ice on water. The morphling stares into Peta's eyes, hanging on to his words. One time, I spent three days mixing paint until I found the right shade for sunlight on white fur. You see, I kept thinking it was yellow, but it was much more than that. Layers of all sorts of color, one by one. The morphling's breathing is slowing into shallow catch breaths. Her free hand dabbles on the blood in her chest, making tiny, swirling motions she so loved to paint with. I haven't figured out a rainbow yet. They come so quickly and leave so soon. I never have enough time to capture them. Just a bit of blue here or a purple there. And then they fade away again, back into the air. The morphling seems mesmerized by Peta's words, entranced. She lifts up a trembling hand and paints what I think might be a flower on Peta's cheek. Thank you. That looks beautiful. For a moment, the morphling's face lights up in a grin, and she makes a small squeaking sound. Then her blood-dappled hand falls back to her, onto her chest. She gives a last huff of air, and the cannon fires. The grip on my hand releases. Peta carries her out into the water and returns to sit by me. The morphling floats out toward the cornucopia for a while, then the hovercraft appears, and four... Pronged claw drops and cases her, carries her into the night sky, and she's gone. Finnick rejoins us, his fist full of arrows still wet with monkey blood. He drops them beside me in the sand. Thought you might want these. Thanks, I say. I wade into the water and wash off the gore from my weapons, my wounds. By the time I return to the jungle to gather some moss to dry them, all the monkeys' bodies have vanished. Where do they go? I ask. We don't know exactly. The vines shifted and they were gone. We stare at the jungle, numb and exhausted. In the quiet, I notice that the spots where the fog droplets touch my skin have scabbed over. They've stopped hurting and begun to itch. Intensely. I try to think of this as a good sign, that they're healing. I glance over at Peta, at Finnick, and see they're both scratching at their damaged faces. Yes, even Finnick's beauty has been marred by this night. Don't scratch, I say, wanting badly to scratch myself but I know it's the advice my mother would give. You'll only bring infection. Think it's safe to try for the water again? We make our way back to the tree Peta was tapping. 
Finnick and I stand with our weapons poised while he works the spile in, but no threat appears. Pete has found a good vein and water begins to gush from the spile. We slake our thirst, let the warm water pour over our itching bodies. We fill handfuls of shells with drinking water and go back to the beach. It's still night, though dawn can't be too many hours away, unless the game makers want it to be. Why don't you two get some rest? I'll watch for a while. No. Katniss, I'd rather. Says Fennec. I look in his eyes, at his face, and realize he's barely holding back tears. Mags. The least I can do is give him the privacy to mourn her. All right, Finnick. Thanks, I say. I lie down on the sand with Peta, who drifts off at once. I stare into the night, thinking of what a difference a day makes, how yesterday morning Finnick was on my kill list, and now I'm willing to sleep with him as my guard. He saved Peta and let Mags die, and I don't know why. Only that I can never settle the balance owed between us. All I can do at the moment is go to sleep and let him grieve in peace. And so I do. It's mid-morning when I open my eyes again. Pete is still out beside me. Above us, a mat of grass suspended on branches shields our faces from the sunlight. I sit up and see Finnick's hands have not been idle. Two woven bowls are filled with fresh water. A third holds a mess of shellfish. Finnick sits on the sand, cracking them open with a stone. They're better fresh. He says, ripping a chunk of flesh from the shell and popping it into his mouth. His eyes are still puffy, but I pretend not to notice. My stomach begins to growl at the smell of food and I reach for one. The sight of my fingernails caked with blood stops me. I've been scratching my skin raw in my sleep. You know, if you scratch, you'll bring on infection. That's what I've heard, I say. I go into the salt water and wash off the blood, trying to decide which I hate more, pain or itching. Fed up, I stomp back to the beach, turn my face upward and snap. Hey, hey, Mitch, if you're not too drunk, we could use a little something for our skin. It's almost funny how quickly the parachute appears above me. I reach up and the tube lands squarely in my open hand. About time, I say, but I can't keep the scowl on my face. Hey, Mitch, what I wouldn't give for five minutes of conversation with him. I plunk down on the sand next to Finnick and screw the lid off the tube. Inside is a thick, dark ointment with a pungent smell, a combination of tar and pine needles. I wrinkle my nose as I squeeze a glob of medicine onto my palm and begin to massage it into my leg. A sound of pleasure slips out of my mouth as the stuff eradicates my itching. It also stains my scabby skin a ghastly gray-green. As I start on the second leg, I toss the tube to Finnick, who eyes me doubtfully. It looks like you're decomposing says Finnick, but I guess the itching wins out because after a minute, Finnick begins to treat his own skin too. Really, the combination of scabs and the ointment looks hideous. I can't help enjoying his distress. Poor Finnick. Is this the first time in your whole life you haven't looked pretty? I say. It must be. The sensation's completely new. How have you managed it all these years? Just avoid mirrors. You'll forget about it. Not if I keep looking at you. We slather ourselves down, even taking turns rubbing ointment on each other's backs where our undershirts don't protect our skin. I'm going to wake Peta, I say. No, wait. Let's do it together. Put our faces right in front of his. Well, there's so little opportunity for fun left in my life. I agree. We position ourselves on either side of Peta, lean over our faces until we're inches from his nose, give him a shake. Peta, Peta, wake up, I say in a soft, sing-song voice. His eyes flutter open and he jumps like we've stabbed him. Ah! Finnick and I fall back in the sand, laughing our heads off. Every time we try to stop, we look at Peter's attempt to maintain a disdainful expression and it sets us off again. By the time we pull ourselves together, I'm thinking that Finnick O'Dare is all right. At least not as vain and self-important as I'd thought. Not so bad at all, really. And just as I've come to this conclusion, a parachute lands next to us with a fresh loaf of bread. Remembering from last year how Hamish's gifts are often time to send a message, I make note to myself. Be friends with Finnick, you'll get food. Finnick turns the bread over in his hands, examining the crust, a bit too possessively. It's not necessary. It's got a green tint from seaweed that the bread from District 4 always has. We all know it's his. Maybe he's just realized how precious it is, that he may never see another loaf again. Maybe some memory of Mags is associated with the crust, but all he says is, this will go well with the shellfish. While I help Peter coat his skin with the ointment, Finnick deftly cleans the meat from the shellfish. We gather around and eat the delicious sweet flesh from the salty bread from District 4. 
We all look monstrous. The ointment seems to be causing some of the scabs to peel, but I'm glad for the medicine. Not just because it gives relief from the itching, but also because it acts as protection from the blazing white sun in the pink sky. By its position, I estimate it must be going on 10 o'clock, though we've been in the arena for about a day. 11 of us are dead, 13 alive. Somewhere in the jungle, 10 are concealed. Three or four are the careers. I don't really feel like trying to remember who the others are. For me, the jungle has quickly evolved from a place of protection to a sinister trap. I know at some point we'll be forced to re-enter its depths, either to hunt or be hunted. But for right now, I'm planning to stick to our little beach. I don't hear Peta or Finnick suggesting we do otherwise. For a while, the jungle seems almost static, humming, shimmering, but not flaunting its dangers. Then, in the distance comes screaming. Across from us, a wedge of the jungle begins to vibrate. An enormous wave crests high on the hill, topping the trees and roaring down the slope. It hits the existing seawater with such force that even though we're as far as we could get from it, the surf bubbles up around our knees, setting our few possessions afloat. Among the three of us, we manage to collect everything before it's carried off, except for our chemical-ridden jumpsuits, which are so eaten away, no one really cares if we lose them. A cannon fires. We see the hovercraft appear over the arena where the wave began and pluck a body from the trees. Twelve, I think. The circle of water slowly calms down, having absorbed the giant wave. We rearrange our things back on the wet sand and are about to settle down when I see them. Three figures, about two spokes away, stumbling on the beach. There, I say quietly, nodding in the newcomer's direction. Peta and Finnick follow my gaze. As if by previous agreement, we all fade back into the shadows of the jungle. The trio's in bad shape. You can see that right off. One is being practically dragged out by the second and the third wanders in loopy circles as if deranged. They're all a solid brick red color, as if they'd all been dipped in paint and left to dry. Who is that? Or what? Mutations? I draw back an arrow, readying for an attack, but all that happens is the one who's been dragged collapses on the beach. The dragger stamps the ground in frustration, and an apparent fit of temper turns and shoves the circling deranged one over. Finnick's face lights up. Joanna! He calls and runs for the red things. Finnick! I hear Joanna's voice reply. I exchange a look with Peta. What now? I ask. We can't really leave Finnick. Guess not. Come on then. I say grouchily. Because even if I had had a list of allies, Joanna Mason definitely would not have been on it. The two of us tromp down the beach to where Finnick and Joanna are just meeting up. As we move in closer, I see her companions and the confusion sets in. That's... Beatty, on the ground on his back, and Wireless, who's regained to her feet and to continue making loops. She's got Wireless and Beatty. Nuts and volts? I've got to hear how this happened. When we reach them, Joanna's gesturing toward the jungle and talking very fast to Finnick. We thought it was rain, you know, because of the lightning, and we were all so thirsty, but then it started coming down, and it turned out to be blood. Thick, hot blood. I mean, you couldn't see. You couldn't speak without getting a mouthful. We were just stacking around, trying to get out of it, and, and that's when blight hit the force field. I'm sorry, Joanne. Says Finnick. It takes a moment to place blight. I think he was Joanna's male counterpart from District 7, but I hardly remember seeing him. Come to think of it, I don't even think he showed up for training. Well, he wasn't much, but he was from home. And he left me alone with these two. He got a knife in the back of the cornucopia, and her... We all look over at Wyrus, who's circling around, coated in dried blood and murmuring. Talk, tick, talk, tick, talk. Yeah, we know. Tick, tock. Nuts is in shock. Says Joanna. This seems to draw Wyrus in her direction as she careens into Joanna, who harshly shoves her to the beach. Just stay down, will you? Lay off her, I snap. Joanna narrows her brown eyes at me in hatred. Lay off her? She hisses. She steps forward before I can react and slaps me so hard I see stars. Who do you think got them out of that bleeding jungle for you? You- Finnick tosses her writhing body over his shoulder and carries her out into the water and repeatedly dunks her while she screams a lot of really insulting things at me. But I don't shoot. Because she's with Finnick and because of what she said about getting them for me. What does she mean? She got them for me, I asked Peta. I don't know. You did want them originally. Yeah, I did, originally. But that answers nothing. I look down at Beatty's inert body, but I won't have them long unless we do something. 
Peta lifts Beatty up in his arms, and I take Wyrus by the hand, and we go to our little beach camp. I sit Wyrus in the shallows so she can get washed up a bit, but she just clutches her hands together and occasionally mumbles. Tick tock. I unhook Beatty's belt and find a heavy metal cylinder attached to the side with a rope of vines. I can't tell what it is, but if he thought it was worth saving, I'm not going to be the one who loses it. I toss it up on the sand. Beatty's clothes are glued to him with blood, so Peta holds him in the water while I loosen them. It takes some time to get the jumpsuit off, but then we find his undergarments are saturated with blood as well. There's no choice but to strip him naked to get him clean. But I have to say, this doesn't much make an impression on me anymore. Our kitchen table's been full of so many naked men this year, you kind of get used to it after a while. We put down Finnick's mat and lay Beatty on his stomach so we can examine his back. There's a gash about six inches long running from his shoulder blade down to his ribs. Fortunately, it's not too deep. He has lost a lot of blood, though, you can tell by the pallor of his skin, and it's still oozing out of the wound. I sit back on my heels trying to think, what do I have to work with? Seawater? I feel like my mother, when her first line of defense for treating everything was snow. I look over at the jungle. I bet there's a whole pharmacy in there if I knew how to use it. But these aren't my plants. Then I think about the moss Mags gave me to blow my nose. Be right back, I tell Peta. Fortunately, the stuff seems to be pretty common in the jungle. I rip an armful from the nearby trees and carry it back to the beach. I make a thick pad of moss, place it on Beatty's cut, and secure it by tying vines around his body. We get some water into him and pull him into the shade by the edge of the jungle. I think that's all we can do, I say. It's good. You're good with this healing stuff. It's in your blood? No, I say, shaking my head. I got my father's blood, the kind that quickens during a hunt, not an epidemic. I'm going to go see about Wyrus. I take a handful of moss to use as a rag and join Wyrus in the shallows. She doesn't resist as I work off her clothing, scrub the blood from her skin, but her eyes are dilated with fear, So, and when I speak, she doesn't respond except to say with ever-increasing urgency. Tick-tock. Tick-tock. She does seem to be trying to tell me something, but with no beady to explain her thoughts, I'm at a loss. Yes, tick-tock. Tick-tock, I say. This seems to calm her down a little. I wash out her jumpsuit until there's hardly a trace of blood and help her back into it. It's not damaged like ours were. Her belt's fine, so I fasten that on too. Then I pin her undergarments along with Beatty's under some rocks and let them soak. By the time I've rinsed out Beatty's jumpsuit, a shiny, clean Joanna and peeling Finnick have joined us. For a while, Joanna gulps water and stuffs herself with shellfish while I try to coax something into Wyrus. Finnick tells about the fog and the monkeys in a detached, almost clinical voice, avoiding the most important detail of the story. Everybody offers to guard while others rest, but in the end, it's Joanna and I who stay up. Me, because I'm really rested. She, because she simply refuses to lie down. The two of us sit in silence on the beach until the others have gone to sleep. Joanna glances over at Finnick to be sure, then turns to me. How'd you lose Mags? In the fog. Finnick had Peta. I had Mags for a while, then I couldn't lift her. Finnick said he couldn't take both. She kissed him and walked right into the poison. I say. She was Finnick's mentor, you know. Joanna says accusingly. No, I didn't. She was half of his family. She says a few minutes later, but there's less venom behind it. We watch the water lap up over the undergarments. So what are you doing with nuts and bolts? I ask. I told you. I got them for you. Hamish said if we were to be allies, I had to bring them to you. That's what you told him, right? No, I think but I nod my head in assent. Thanks, I appreciate it. I hope so. She gives me a look filled with loathing, like I'm the biggest drag possible on her life. I wonder if this is what it's like to have an older sister who really hates you. Tick tock. I hear behind me. I turn and see Wyrus has crawled over. Her eyes are focused on the jungle. Oh goody, she's back. Okay, I'm going back to sleep. You and Nats can guard together. Joanna says. She goes over and flings herself down beside Finnick. Tick whispers Wyrus. I guide her in front of me and get her to lie down, stroking her arm to soothe her. She drifts off, stirring restlessly, occasionally sighing out her phrase. Tick tock. Tick tock. I agree softly. It's time for bed. Tick tock. Go to sleep. The sun rises until the sky is directly over us. It must be noon, I think absently. Not that it matters. Across the water off to the right, I see the enormous flash as the lightning bolt hits the tree and the electrical storm begins again right in the same area it did last night. 
Something must have moved into its rain to trigger the attack. I sit for a while, watching the lightning, keeping Wyrus calm, lulled into a sort of peacefulness by the lapping of the water. Think of last night, how the lightning began just after the bell tolled. Twelve bongs. Tick tock. Wyrus says, surfing into consciousness for a moment, then going back under. Twelve bongs last night, like it was midnight. Then lightning. The sun overhead now, like it's noon. And lightning. Slowly I rise up and survey the arena, the lightning there. The next pie wedge over came the blood rain, where Joanna, Wires, and Beatty were caught. We would have been in the third section right next to that when the fog appeared. And as soon as it was sucked away, the monkeys began to gather in the fourth. Tick, tock. My head snapped to the other side. A couple of hours ago, at around ten, that wave came out of the second section to the left of where the lightning strikes now. At noon. At midnight. At noon. Tick tock. Wyra says in her sleep. As the lightning ceases and the blood rain begins just to the right of it, her words suddenly make sense. Oh, I say under my breath. Tick tock. My eyes sweep around the full circle of the arena and I know she's right. Tick tock. This is a clock. <laughs>